We try to get. Are we ready to make some noise? Yes. Excellent. Once again, we have some more people who want to join the exalted ranks of those who have been gusted. And even better, at short notice, Martin has stepped up to the plate because he too wants to have the mark of Cain upon him. <laughs> I was also told to, to, to also advise that those we, we, we now support provide counselling services for those who have been traumatised by the experience that is Gusta. So we have Declan, we'll get Declan on up here for his first one now. Give him a round of applause. I didn't say a cheer, I just said a round of applause. Now, as I said yesterday, and I really do mean it, there is a serious message to this. People are doing presentations under extreme pressure and duress. So they're really feeling the pressure. So if they run over time, I want you to be really loud and tell them to start. I don't want any niceness at all. The whole thing works because of the pressure of failure. But we don't want people to finish too early either. Anywhere between 4 minutes 58 and 4 minutes 59 is absolutely perfect. We don't want anything shorter perfect. than that. Okie dokie. Now we'll just, we'll just start off fairly handy today. There'll be no up and down yet. Are we all ready to go? I'll just do the hain today and then you'll do the rest. Are we ready? A hain! A car. Hello everyone, uh, thanks for coming along. Uh, my name is Declan McLaughlin, I'm a lecturer in education specialising in anatomy from the uh, Queen's University in Belfast and I'm here to talk to you today about our clinical cases that myself and one of my students, Nicole, have done over the past year. So I'll give you a little bit of talk about uh, what our aim of our project was. Um, let's face it, you don't want to hear me talk, you want to see me do the demo um, and then I'll summarise what we did at the end. I should add, I am an anatomist. This presentation does contain gross anatomical specimens. That's gross in the big sense, not gross as in the uh sense. If you are one of those people, okay, not all of you do what I do, um, you might want to uh, divert your eyes. Also, can I ask that if you are taking photographs to tweet or anything, you're just sensitive to the material that's up there and try not to sensationalize it. I'm also not joking, by the way, there are um, body parts coming. There is a little trigger warning will come up. So anatomical education for many years has been essential for various different types of degree pathways, medicine, dentistry, nursing, biomedical science, uh, physiotherapy, human biology. Um, and certainly at Queen's, and I know here at Edinburgh, um, that uh, dissection is taught, in my opinion, the best way, um, or anatomy is taught by dissection and prosections. However, over recent times, there's been a shift towards using more uh, technology-based um, methods of teaching anatomy, not simply, usually, a cost factor because running a cadaveric program in universities is very, very expensive. And these technologies are now becoming a uh, uh, more integral part uh, of anatomy education, um, supplementing it, hopefully, than replacing it. Trigger warning. Um, pathology pots are another fantastic way of teaching anatomy, and at Queen's we're very privileged to have about five or 6,000 of these pots, which would have been taken from biopsies or uh, following autopsies of patients back in the day when rules didn't really apply and surgeons could take what they wanted. Um, but unfortunately, they don't really get used an awful lot in teaching because a lot of them are in various states of disrepair. Um, so we want to try and change that. So our primary um, objective, our first aim really, was to develop some sort of e-learning tool to make these more accessible to our students, studying our anatomical sciences um, pathways. Um, and then second, uh, second to that was to develop the technical skills that gets those really sort of rubbish looking pots looking a little bit more healthier and more useful. Um, and I'll look at that now. So we have to put the cart before the horse in many senses. We go very, very old school. We get rid of all technologies, and we use things like drills and hammers and saws um, to repair some pots. So you've got uh, a liver there on the top, a section of a liver. Uh, it's sitting in some fluid. It's a little bit yellow. It doesn't look too great. And then below it, we have a section of the lumbar vertebrae, so the, the very base, the small of your back, the vertebrae there. It's quite yucky looking. With simple repairs, okay, so we drill holes in the top, we empty the fluid, we give it a little bit of wash, we top it up, we put it in front of a light box, and it looks nice and lovely and brand new, and that's good for another 10, 15 years without us having to touch it, a little bit more accessible to the students. However, 
sometimes the ones that look a little bit more yucky need a little bit more work, and that's when you bring out the saws and the knives. We have Han up in the corner there reminding us to be careful. It also adds uh, another element, because if you're not very careful, then Han Solo will be your new nickname uh, where you work, and we just get another specimen for our collection. Um, but when we repair it, we end up having something that looks a little bit like that. I know it's a little bit small, but we'll look at it later. So how do we do make our posters? Well, we just use PowerPoint, and ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what they are. They're glorified PowerPoint presentations. Um, we didn't just uh, piece them together. We used our learning outcomes from one of our undergraduate modules, and then a couple of textbooks as well. So enough of me talking. Uh, let's see what Phoebe and Rachel want to show us. So this is it. It's a glorified. Uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, it's got lots of QR codes, little links that we can go to. Students can test themselves. With little hyperlinks here that will go out to Google Forms. If you want to come and chat to me outside, I've got the poster, I've got the presentations with me. You can have a little look at them. Um, but students can label these up on one of our uh, big touch screens in our dissection rooms, uh, and they can see how they got on. When we look at our uh, one for osteoporosis, this would have been sent for master's students. Uh, we can start seeing how we use these specimens there. So this just highlights the different places. Um, we can zoom in on different aspects of the specimen. And these are a lot more useful than the one that was full of fat and gunk and lots of uh, bone marrow and things like that. Um, we can also then link to the more clinical, the physiology side of things. I can see you coming, Tom. I can see you coming. <laughs> so in summary, nearly done. Um, Large class sizes, we have 270 students that teach. We want to try and make it slightly more accessible um, to them. Um, Eight, four, three, five, so we want to focus their learning. Five, they use it more as a revision tool. And you can come and chat to me outside. Thanks to everyone, and thank you for your attention. Well done. Straight on. Sorry. But now, as I said, joking aside, and as I meant, we're all the presenters, have a chat afterwards. There's a poster out there like that. Alicia here is a colleague of Laurie, uh, but sadly that won't get her any <laughs> at all. All right, let's just get you underway. Here we go. Are you the next one? Yes. Uh, I'm not ready yet. Ready? No. No? No. Did you hear Costa? Oh, no. Okay. Now, you've had one sort of bit of a count in. So, we just go left and right this time. We start off with Hain, Doe, Tree, Carr, Cooey, everybody together. But this time at the Coop, at the Costa, I want a big arm. So we need to start getting the cardiovascular going. We've been doing the step up and down. I know everybody loved that. And God forbid you put down your laptop for two seconds. Now it's an EdTech conference, but who do? We start off here on the, the clay side, by the way. There you are. Clay is left. Jass is right. A little bit more. Couple of fuckle. Couple of fuckle means couple of words. I know you all thought it was something else. That's all it means. That's all. Are we ready? Uh, hey! It's people up in the first seats not doing anything. I can... You do know like it's a class, I can see you. So we'll try that one again. Are we ready? Yeah. Hey! Go! Let's Go! Hi, I'm Alexia Shaw. I'm a senior creative design manager at JISC. I work for the research and development um, department in the student experience team. And today I would like to talk to you about um, defining digital well-being. Well, for us, digital well-being is one part, one element of the dig building digital capability framework. Um, and we've been doing a little bit of work around it, trying to uh, see what the landscape is, what's happening in this space, but also to um, reconsider the definition that we have. Because the definition that we have at the moment is focusing very much on the individual. So we wanted to broaden the context. <clears throat> and show that digital well-being is a complex concept that can be viewed from a variety of perspectives and has several aspects within a range of contexts. So, for example, um, the different perspectives that we have identified 
It can be individual, organizational, community, or global. And different aspects or impacts that digital um, will have um, around all these um, emotional, social, physical, or um, mental spheres. And also, you can look at digital well-being through different lenses um, of where it's being used. So different contexts around community, personal work, or learning. So this is um, our new definition. Um, it has two sort of parts. This is the part one, where it talks about the individual. So we say that digital well-being considers the impact of technologies and digital services on people's mental, physical, and emotional health. We can view this from an individual perspective in personal learning or work context. This means understanding and identifying the positive and negative aspects of engaging with digital activities and being aware of ways to manage and control these to improve well-being. And here examples include managing digital workload or safe and appropriate use interaction with digital system services and content. And then we move on to uh, the, the wider perspective. So we can also view digital well-being from a broader societal or organizational perspective where service providers need to recognize and take responsibility for ensuring that digital systems, services, or content are well managed, supported, accessible, and equitable. They also need to empower and build capability in their staff, service users, so including students, and partners to engage with these in a way that supports and improves their well being. And here, examples include recognizing and acknowledging the impact on users and generating an organizational culture that supports and enhances digital. There are sort of further examples there. And looking at different aspects, um, there are different aspects of health and well-being in a broad sense. So mental health, emotional well-being, social well-being, physical health. And digital can have both negative and positive um, impacts on all of these. Talking about different contexts, again, um, we can have um, digital social well-being, personal well-being, digital learning well-being, and work well-being. And again, each of these we can look at positives and negatives. So here I just um, picked the digital personal well-being. And if you think about positives, we can uh, think about creating a positive identity, building self-worth, enjoyment, but also there are some negatives, such as negative comparison with others, um, addictive behaviors, passive um, consumption. So the, our new definition um, broadened the context and also tries to show that it's a complex picture uh, and also that we have to look both at negatives and positives. So we are hoping that you're going to join the discussion uh, on Twitter with the hashtag digital wellbeing. Um, we invite you to our digital community um, of practice event, which is happening in Edinburgh on 27th of November, where we're going to be having a little bit more discussion and workshop session around it. There's also a mailing list, um, and we have published a blog post recently with a new definition, and we would invite you to comment and send your feedback. I'm done. Four forty six. Hate that. Right. Now I said there was there was a the jazz side was a little bit poor now today or this afternoon there. There wasn't much arm lifting or anything like that. This is for your health. I'm thinking about you. This is getting it up there and getting the blood moving around. You put that up there and raise it up. Okay, we'll make that big. Right. Okie dokie. Right we'll try it again, but this time, definitely this side here was much better, so I want a bit, a bit more noise from, from this side in particular. Are we ready? We start this side with the hand. All together on the cooig and all together on the hands up with the gossip. Are we ready? That, was, that wasn't rhetorical, that was a real question. <laughs> Are we ready? Yes! Uh, hey. Thank you. 
Um, I'm Don Carmichael. I'm a lecturer in software engineering. I better come over here so you can hear, actually hear me. Uh, from Glasgow Caledonian University. And I'm here to talk to you about a feedback literacy framework that we've been working on. So I'm going to start off a little bit of uh, interaction again. Wow, I'm really looking forward to finding out why I didn't get an A. So do you hear that a lot from students? No? No? Did you hear that for a lot from students? No. Indeed. Well, listen up. I'll give you some ideas about how to avoid it in the future. Okay? So anyway, um, the idea here is that um, over a number of different measures, uh, and too numerous to mention, students have made it clear that they do not uh, find, the thing they find least satisfactory is feedback. There can be a myriad of reasons of why this might be the case. It could be that a lot of students are actually um, used to more declarative and corrective feedback from schools. And it could be that uh, academic uh, staff are faced with complex and sophisticated and abstract knowledge base that they cannot just reduce down to a few points to, to fix and, and to get right. But whatever the reason for this, and we've tried tackling it you know, across the sector, technology, staff workshops, the lot, maybe it's time to think about how the, the students at the center of this and how we can actually facilitate them in, in having a rather better experience of, um, of their uh, feedback. Okay then, uh, basically what we've done is we've constructed a workbook using um, the Blackboard uh, quizzing tool. It's made up of discussion forums and questions and assignments. It's meant to be uh, associated with a real world setting as well as being online, so it's not really intended to be distance learning. Now on the left of the slide as you look at it are the content areas. These are the topics that we talk to students about. They're basically cluing them in on the rules of the game that they may not be aware of. And over on your right of the screen are the activities we use to try to underpin these things. So then there's three content areas from the bottom up. And we look at the idea of structure. That's basically where you get feedback. Students can just think of this as, well, why they didn't get an A, basically. And as we've already thought about that, it's not really that helpful. Um, to think about actually asking questions at seminars and tutorials when they're preparing their assessment work. Wouldn't be a bad idea. And key about this, reuse of feedback. Hopefully, if I'm not dragged off the stage, I'll have enough, to return to that at the, enough time to return to that at the end. Um, attitude. We also deal with this idea of the disappointment, the affective domain, if you will, and actually helps. We intend to at least endeavor to help students deal with the disappointment by objectifying their work, flawed work is not flawed self, but also to see that emotional reaction to feedback as part of the feedback process itself and to ameliorate that with discussions with staff and with uh, peers. Thinking skills, clearly with this type of approach that's meant to empower students, the idea of metacognition is, is absolutely central and therefore in supporting students to make uh, self-judgments before they hand in work. But here's one of these things that I mentioned about the idea of rules of the game. Well, cue seeking, for example, students who tend to do well tend to cue seek. That means, for example, they're honing in on things that are important to the problem domain. I'm absolutely certain that you've honed in at the idea of metacognition, and that's going to be important with the idea of a feedback literacy framework. And also, they, they have antenna going for anything to do with the word assessment coming out of the lecturer's mouth. And these are types of, of ideas. Then, of course, if you, if you include everybody into this, then hopefully they will start to have a, a richer experience of where feedback might be coming from. Um, we also then, moving on to the activities, and we'll just have enough to, to give you a few uh, ideas there. Exemplars tend to be very popular with students, and rather more so than rubrics, incidentally, which they find even more abstract, and especially students who can struggle with an area, well, then they can actually find that that's just a little bit, uh, you know, too abstract for them. So exemplars can be quite good, but again, they are concrete, context-specific and trying to, to get students to actually look at the, the more general things that we can define from it. And we, we have exercises like icebreakers to get across the idea of reflective dialogue. And that very last thing before Dyer calls me off, I'd just like to make the point, future planning, the idea of encouraging students to see feedback 
as the at the start of an assessment process by reusing the feedback they already have. And uh, so thank you very much. A doe, a tree, a car, quick stop. <laughs> Should be nice and no. Should be. Yeah, I think it's time. I think it's a bit limbered up. We have enough of this sort of left right confrontation. We've had enough of that now, 200 miles south or 300 miles south. And... So, anyway, we'll start off everybody together. Put the hands up in the air, we'll sway to the left and to the right. Are we ready? Hands up. A hay, a doe, a tree, a car. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Blanith McSharry. I'm a learning technologist from NUI Galway, and I'm so excited to be here today in such a fantastic venue to talk to you a bit about a project we've been running over the last three years at NUI Galway that's called Digital Champions. And specifically, what I'm going to talk about is how we have used Champions to foster partnership within the campus community. So, firstly, what is Digital Champions? So the aim of Digital Champions is to improve the digital confidence of all of those working and learning in, in um, NUI Galway. So it's aimed at both staff and students. So building digital confidence is crucial to the success of both staff and students. But we want to do more than just build confidence. We also want to provide our participants with the opportunity to explore opportunities to, um, to become innovative and to use technology in different ways. So more traditional uh, approaches to building di digital confidence would include um, taught courses or running workshops. But with Digital Champions, what we want to do is run a case study um, in the design and provision of flexible and collaborative approaches to building digital confidence and how we can use this program to cascade the knowledge throughout the university. And the most central aspect to this is the idea of partnership. So what do we do? So the first... Um, the first element of Digital Champions is that it's a staff and student partnership. So students are involved at all levels of the um, development of the program. So they're involved from the side of uh, designing the workshops, they're involved in teaching some of the workshops, and what we have found is that workshops are open to both staff and students. But the feedback that we have had is that Digital Champions is one of the very few spaces on campus where staff and students can come together as equals to learn and to share their experiences. So just to tell you a little bit more about our workshops. So um, each of our workshops are run over lunchtime. Um, they're meant to be in a fun and relaxed atmosphere. So we have cafe style layout, uh, we have pizzas, there's lots of inbuilt discussion points. Um, participants are encouraged to walk around, to chat with each other. Um, it's relaxed and um, there's no pressure on anyone to come to more than they wish. So you can dip in and out as you see fit. So another element that has been, um, I guess, unexpected when it comes to digital champions is the idea of building partnerships on campus. So not only is it a staff and student partnership, but we have found it to be a great way within the Teaching and Learning Centre to build partnerships with other student initiatives, with curricular and co-curricular activities. So we run workshops with um, career service, we run workshops with our volunteering service, so there's lots of overlap and we want to build on that overlap so we can create those partnerships on campus. And one of the things that we've also found is that oftentimes with these types of initiatives there can be the competitive side to it um, where an initiative is competing with another one to see can they get more students or how can they promote themselves on campus. But we're very lucky in that in our teaching and learning centre the, the Digital Champions programme has been mainstreamed. So we don't have any need to compete with anyone on campus. We really just want to work together. Um, we also try to work together with student leaders. So we work with our peer learning scheme and we work with Student Connect and we, work, we run workshops with um, student leaders who then can cascade that knowledge onto their peers. So if you like what you've heard and you're interested in finding more, um, what we have done is put together a Digital Champions Toolkit. So you can see it here. I can share out the link and put it onto the session page. And what this Digital Champions Toolkit has is it, it takes you through, if you're interested in running a similar initiative in your institution, it takes you through the model. 
Um, it runs through how, how you could run something similar. And it also has, I think, a set of seven or eight full workshop lesson plans. So you can get some ideas of the types of activities that you could run with your students. So I have two or three of these here if anyone would like to talk to me afterwards or if anyone would like to find out a bit more about it or take one of these home. It's openly licensed, it's an OER, so you can download it, reuse it, and remix it. Um, again, we have a poster too, if you'd like to find out a bit more about the initiative. So this is available on um, our session page, it's available on our website too, and you can find out more about our journey from pilot to mainstream with Digital Champions. And lastly, if you'd like to read more about the project, um, we have a website, it's called www.digichampsnuig.com, and if you want to connect with the project, uh, I'm Blonis McSherry, and our project is at digichamps. Dot, dot, uh, to NUIG. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, done. Well, done. well done. that's yeah. That's last rewards. Excellent. Hopefully, we we're starting to beat that old mid-afternoon slump. I think it's time for the legs to be moved. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. It's like Death Eaters in the room, isn't it? It just sucks the life out of it like that. So you remember the, you remember the routine? Up on Hain, down on Doe, up on Three, down on Cahar, up on Cooig, get the arms up. And I want a huge roar of Gosta. The count is okay, but I want a big Gosta. Are we ready? Yeah. Go for it. Thanks. <laughs> you ready? Hey! No, no, they're too slow, too slow. <laughs> I want a bit of snap of speed. Are we ready? Hey! hey. Do. Three. Car. Cooey. Go! Thank you. Um, my name's Joe Nichols. I'm based at Cardiff University. I'm an education consultant there. Um, I've put up a digital poster with the link here is the bit.ly slash alt underscore poster if you want more details there. And there's a form at the back that if you'd like to ask questions or get in touch, then please do so. So the educational challenge that is the focus here is that we have many undergraduate students who arrive at university having not written very much, and in particular, not very experienced at writing academic essays. Now, in the context I've been look, working in, which is in bioscience and in STEM subjects generally, educators recognize this as being quite a key problem. Much work that the undergraduates do in terms of developing academic, academic knowledge and being assessed about it is through um, essay writing. So the other problem that goes with this is you have a packed curriculum, and the core curriculum doesn't tend to allow very much space for learning activities to develop learning literacies and study skills. And so that creates a problem. And especially when you run workshops for what's nearly 500 students in the first year intake of bioscience. So trying to cater for those individual needs of the students is a real problem. And that has implications for the individual student, the new student, the new undergraduate. So the university over the years has produced many different kinds of learning resources that are applicable to writing and other things associated with writing. But the problem is, and there's research evidence to show this generally, and anecdotal evidence within the university, that students don't tend to access these resources very well, very often. And that's a problem. So what we're trying to do is make it much easier for the students to do this. Now, historically, what happens is in the VLE, links to all these centrally provisioned resources and support services are put as links in the module page to go along with the assignment. And so it's left up to the individual student, to take, the onus is on them to take responsibility to seek out and find what they need to do their writing just when they need it. Now, you can imagine that for a new undergraduate student, new to university, with all the distractions, the social distractions, the academic load, the unknown, you know, everything that's going on, that this is 
it takes quite a lot of motivation and dedication to actually seek out these sorts of things just when they need them. So the idea here that we're trying to do is bridge this gap between what academic services are offering and what the students need and fit that with the curriculum. So the idea we've come up with is an assignment wrapper. So we're replacing what was in the VLE with a Xerti learning object that brings the assignment details together with a conceptual model of essay writing that makes explicit all the key steps and associated practices with writing their first academic essay and trying to pitch it for a new undergraduate. So this would, would evolve in the future. And the idea then is that this then signposts and links to all the central resources that the student needs at the moment they're doing it. So the real difference here is they've got no choice but to access this model. Where previously all they had to read was the assignment title and perhaps navigate some other pages, now they're immersed in a model. It still doesn't mean that they will go on necessarily and use it, but what we're doing is really kind of pushing it in their face to see if it makes a difference. Now the idea then is to compare their essay writing performance with previous cohorts to see if it has any impact on academic performance. There's no guarantees that it will, it's just that one of the things that we're challenged with in central services is that we need to provide empirical evidence of the impact of services on learning. And this is an attempt to do that, to see if we can come up with some data to do it. So the idea, we're at the moment we're building, pulling all these resources together, they're already there, it's just building the framework, integrating it into the VLE for the start of the academic year, and hopefully we're gonna run with a study for about 500 students on a formative essay that they will get feedback on and loop back into the learning resources. Now, if this actually works, it will have tremendous impact on other kinds of learning activities and have implications across courses and curriculum if these conceptual models work. So if you'd like more information, please go and visit the poster. Thanks very much. <laughs> Yeah. I don't like the last two speakers who are right on the button and we don't want that. We want people running over to them. That's what the crowd demands. Building up for a big last crescendo. Martin is the last so coming up with something special for that. We'll just get back to our sways again because I think people are falling asleep again. We don't want any more of that. Are we ready? Hands up. This time we're going to start to the right. Are we ready? Ahain. Two, three, five, three, yes. Okay, hi, my name is Carolyn Ratchke. I am an instructional designer at the University of the Highlands and Islands. And I will talk a bit about a project that I've been living and breathing for the last nine months namely our implementation of um, Brightspace. So orange is the new black. We were with Blackboard before, and now we're with Brightspace. Um, the goals in, in implementing our new VLE were, um, on the one hand side, to build capacity and confidence in the use of the new learning environment, but also to enhance teaching and learning practice consistent with the uh, university's learning and teaching enhancement strategy. A link to this strategy is um, in the um, uh, submission that we made on the website. Um, we faced a couple of challenges because UHI is a very um, distributed um, organization. So you can see on the map, um, that's a map of all of our campuses, of our colleges. So we have 13 different academic partners all across the highlands and on the islands. Um, and, and on top of that, 70 local learning centers. Um, on top of the geo, uh, geographical distribution, um, we also teach anything from FE um, to HNC, HND, and HE, which means that we have a lot of different um, programs and staff has very um, varied needs in terms of what they do with their VLE. So our approach was um, a very flexible approach. Um, we wanted to provide staff with a lot of choice to really foster engagement with the new VLE, and we as the project team um, were adapting and reacting to staff needs as quickly as we could. 
Um, we so far evaluated um, our um, implementation of the new VLE mostly with surveys that we gave to the champions that we had at the academic partners. So we always had a local person who did training and was a point of um, contact for all the staff there. And we also did surveys with staff. Um, going forward, when people are more comfortable in the new VLE, we also want to do a module into unit enhancement review to see how people are using the new VLE to enhance their teaching. Um, the framework we used for our um, implementation is the ProSci APRA model. If you're not familiar with that, it has five components. First of all, to raise awareness and create desire, then to um, create knowledge and the ability to, to use the, the change, so the new VLE in our case, and then um, the reinforcement. So how have we done this? Um, first, raising awareness and creating desire. Um, the most important bit was to get um, as much stakeholder buy-in and engagement as we could, and that means um, senior management and the academic partners, as well as um, from staff. Um, we tried to use as many communication channels as possible, and um, we found that actually staff preferred the local communication channels. So as you can see from the graph, most staff actually found out about the new VLE from their local champions. The theme of um, preferring local support um, or, or local um, communication um, continued in, in our um, um, fostering knowledge and ability. So we delivered face-to-face -face sessions, either delivered by the champion or a member of the team, um, as well as some online training um, through webinars, a self-directed online module, and recently virtual drop-in sessions. But again, as you can see from the graphs, um, staff actually preferred um, workshops, um, they preferred um, local drop-in sessions, and they weren't too keen on the webinars and the VCs, so we have shifted um, our approach according to what we heard from staff. Um, the phase that we're in right now is the reinforcement, so staff are starting to teach um, in the new VLE on Monday, and then we'll go forward and um, con or concentrate on especially the enhancement. Um, some of the results that we've seen so far um, and, and lessons that we've learned is that time and timing is really essential, and we just want to stress the first point here. Um, staff really need protected time to engage with the new VLE. Um, because we're such a unique institution, we have a lot of staff that is part-time, so they had sometimes issues um, engaging with all the training or making it to professional development events. Um, and we had some industrial action earlier in the year, um, which created some, some issues as well, because, again, it, it took away um, time from staff to engage with the new VLE. Um, flexibili uh, flex uh, flexibility is really key. Um, so we try to provide as many varied opportunities as possible for engagement with staff. Um, and due to the tertiary nature of our um, institution and the different um, programs that we have, as I said, FE, HNC, HND, and HE, we had to work closely with individual program teams to really meet all the different needs they have and talk about how they can um, use the VLE um, to the best of their potential. And, um, but to end on a, on a positive note, so we're not at the end yet, as I said, we're looking more at enhancement, but students so far have said that um, they find the new VLE easy to use and navigate and very intuitive. And if you want to learn more about what we did, here's my email address. Thank you. <laughs>going to have that in my dreams tonight. <laughs> Hello everybody, good afternoon. Um, my first guest to talk, this is exciting. Uh, right, so I've got five minutes to tell you three things. If I can go to the next slide. Here we go. Uh, one, who I am. Two, what I do. And how we can work together. So my name is Robert Trehan. I'm a lecturer, lecturer in life sciences at the University of Liverpool. I spend most of my time teaching undergraduate students uh, mathematics and statistics for my sins. Um, that's not what I'm going to talk about um, because I also build highly specialized uh, web applications that really deal with a lot 
more of the logistical aspects of our teaching within our school. Um, so let's talk about that first. So I build these, uh, these web apps that improve student experience, uh, reduce staff admin, which is quite an important one in our school, and for me personally, uh, that are vehicles for research. So I do a lot of my pedagogical uh, research using these things. It generates a lot of quantitative data that I can use. Um, a couple of examples. Uh, so if there are any program directors or module organizers in the room that are responsible for helping students choose modules, um, this might be useful for you. Uh, in, for our biological sciences program, so we've got 400 students, uh, and across three years they get to choose any permutation of about 20 modules out of 140. Okay, so generally every student has a unique experience. Our university intranet um, static website is absolutely useless at providing them with information in an organized manner that allows them to make informed decisions about the modules that they take. So we built this. This module scrapes all of that data into a single um, dynamic website. Um, it also builds in historical data um, using past student choices and builds it into a nice little Amazon-style system where they can click a selection of modules, they can look at the information associated with one, they can see if, if, if I choose this module, um, previously students have also chosen this module, so they get nice little recommendations. It really helps them out, really helps out our program directors because that then builds a little transcript that gets sent to them and they can approve those module choices to make sure there are no conflicts with timetabling or other prerequisites or anything like that. So you can go, that, that's live, you can go and take a look at that now at livechoices.com. Uh, another example, do, do, do. so who's been to Ikea recently? You know the little t the kiosk at the end with that smiley face is on? How about one of those for your lecture? Um, so as students are coming out of their lecture, uh, we have a, a tablet mounted to the wall, or they can get to it via a link, and they can immediately rate with a single touch what they thought of that lecture. Um, they can give a 140 characters worth of feedback as well. That's really, really useful for us, um, because otherwise our students are waiting till the very end of a semester often to provide an evaluation of that. So they've often forgotten you know, what they thought of that lecture by the time they do that. And this also really encourages um, feedback from those students who never give feedback. And often they're the ones who you know, would provide positive feedback. So you get a much more balanced overview of what students actually think of a given set of lectures or a lecturer. Um, again, this is, a, this is in beta phase at the moment, but this will be something that you can access very soon for free. Uh, I want as many people to use it as possible. Um, I'm currently using it in all my modules to give uh, an overview of what's going on. Okay, other things that I do. It'll go to the next slide. Um, project allocate. Anyone uh, here responsible for sorting out honours project allocations in a module? I see a hand up there. Isn't that stressful? Uh, so we have uh, 400 students in our fourth year. Um, who have to be allocated projects to over 200 academics. That is a nightmare, so I've built a system that does that in a very objective way. Uh, we also have, up oh, too far, a system for peer attendance monitoring. So a little app that students can log into, well, it's loginless, but they can go in and to ensure that they, attend, they, they submit their attendance, they can only submit it if they get a code from their peers. So they have to be in, their room, in the room to uh, submit their attendance. I'm pretty much done, it's okay. If I can just... A hain, a doe, a tree, a car, a cooing, start. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, there we are. Last but certainly not least, the man who's going to squash a 20 minute presentation into five minutes. Oh, it's says you. Oh, it is. Now, I think I wanted to serenade him. So, this time we're going to sing the countdown. Now, it's very simple. We're just going to keep to the tune of a doe deer. So, it'll be a hain, a doe, a tree, a car, okay. cooey, and now he can start your gusta. Will be your rehearsal? 
Hold oh, on, let me find where I am. No, first. I think they'll need a rehearsal. Now, we'll just, you can just sotto voce for the moment. Are we ready? A hay, a dog, a tree, a car, cooing, and now we can search your Augusta. I don't know where it is. Where is it, Martin? Where is it, Martin? I think you need a bit more rehearsal time, Martin. So this time. was a, a last minute Gaster thing, so yeah. um, it's not that I'm incompetent or anything That's like that. Yeah, we'll have another quick rehearsal. Are we ready? A hain, a doe, a tree, a car, oh, the one with the cooing, and now you can start your Augusta. Cool. We're ready to go? We're ready to go, yeah. Oh, you don't know how much I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> I want everybody to sing like your heart's dependent on it. Sing, pretend you're in Murrayfield or the Aviva Stadium or even Twickenham. Are we ready? A hain, a doe, a tree, a car, a cooey, and now you can start your Augusta. Right, I'm timing it too, Tom, so don't think. Right, so this is a talk I'm giving next week, so it's the last 20 minutes, so we're going to do it in five, okay? So that, that's, that's no worries. So I'm going to talk about GoGM, which is the Global OER Graduate Network, which I'm a director. Uh, so the aim of the talk, we'll talk about what the aim of it is, um, what we do, some analysis of our network, and some feedback from our members, and some lessons I think that you could apply to other research networks you wanted to develop. As the aim was, um, we launched it, well, I say it was launched uh, by Fred Mould at AU Netherlands um, in 2011, I think. And um, at the time, open educational resources was quite a kind of emerging field. And in order to try and grow that research field, they wanted to kind of develop a global research community. And they decided to focus on doctoral researchers as the way to do that. So our process is, um, if you're a PhD student or ED student studying something vaguely in the area of OER, you apply to the network and we, we look at your application and admit you, but you need to be kind of actually doing a PhD, not thinking about doing one, and it needs to be in that kind of general area. We then bring um, some of them together for an annual seminar where they spend two really intensive days with us. They get to present about their research and we run other sessions on um, being an open researcher. That's usually allied to a conference, usually OE Global, although this year it was um, OER 19 in, in Galway. We run webinars, we've got a very active Twitter, conference, uh, Twitter account, we send out newsletters, we share resources, and we just try to develop this very supportive network. And we also give out um, awards every year for best uh, paper and best OE, uh, open educational practice. We really want them to become open practitioners as well, not just researchers who come in and look at this open stuff and then go away and don't do it anymore. Uh, so currently we've got 113 members, um, we've run four seminars in these places, lovely to get away. Uh, we take about 15 researchers to each one, we've done 23 webinars over this time. Uh, and at OER 19 there were 31 presentations from uh, GoGM members, so it's pretty, so I think we've become a really kind of visible presence at these conferences. Uh, we ran a survey this year and we had 38 responses from 14 different countries, so it's kind of representative I think of our, of our network. Uh, oh, I need to change the font of that. So the, the, we asked people what their kind of research area was. So blue is looking at MOOCs. Um, orange is open educational practice. Uh, gray is OER. And um, yellow is open distance learning. So it's that kind of broad area around open education. And what, are they, what activities have they done? So this kind of demonstrates they tend to do a range of things with us. Uh, which is mo most useful, coming to the workshops is always most useful, that they really value those two days. Um, we ask them to rate the features, so generally they're very positive about everything we do, but building that community and networking is really important to them. Uh, we ask them what methodologies they're using, they tend to be quite qualitative, our people, but I think what this really demonstrates is they're just using a lot of methodologies, often mixed methods, you know, there wasn't kind of one that really stood out. Um, this is some of the feedback uh, on the seminar, so uh, as I'm saying, the seminar actually impacted my research plans immediately, and they connected with participants and went back and changed what they were doing. People were saying it was priceless, you know. Um, I, I, the, one of the messages that often comes across is people often feel quite isolated, this student says, uh, all too often I felt like an outsider, since fewer are interested in the same thing that I am, and they, meeting up with others kind of really changed their perspective. Um, I've got to say our, our members really love us and we really love them. It's a kind of very supportive collegiate network. Uh, and this kind of message of overcoming isolation was really important for them. So some says, being so far away and isolated and in a broken institution, I was thankful for the community and collegiality. And I brag about how friendly it is uh, to people in other research fields. 
and this person saying, meeting fellow Gojian researchers face to face this year has made enormous impact on me. Hold on. Right, so things we want to improve. So we, we're coming to the end of one lot of funding, hoping to get some more funding. We want to try and we get a kind of peak of activity around the seminar. We want to kind of get that going more throughout the year. We want to encourage more participants from Global South. Now we've got alumni, we want to have more of them involved. Um, so quickly, lessons. Um, I think emotional support is really important, and often we don't build that into projects. Like, how do you, what's your KPI for emotional support? Like, number of hugs given, you know. But actually, that's what the thing that our students really value. A face to face and online mix is important. Meeting people face to face with them and allowing them to carry on um, online. People need to make connections with others, and that's been really important across different countries, different methodologies. So it takes money to, and effort to grow a sustainable community. Um, Dr. Stoops are a good place to start. You'll never take me alive, Tom. So <laughs> if you do want to get in touch, if you have someone in this area, please get in touch with us at gojen.net. Hey. Go Thank you to the Hewlett Three. Foundation and Brian Cat. Mathers for hey, the Chloe. lovely start. graphics. It's well done. I know a short note was done easy. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, will all the presenters please stand up again. And as I said yesterday, please stand up. You all entered here as presenters. They now leave as gusteteers. Well done. Edina's work with learning technologists helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with Notable, our Jupyter Notebook service. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology.